to the spider queen the nation's cup continues we are down to the final eight everybody and we have a full round robin this is round number one play day number one and over on the left side denmark on the right we have spain and quick reminder denmark did actually not get here by directly qualifying so what happened is that russia initially qualified and already from the first group stage they were in communication with us saying like hey guys we're going to try and get our visas as quickly as possible to see if that's happening if there's a problem we're going to let you know and then shortly after the first group stage they contacted us and said that some of their players weren't able to uh, get a visa military service involved mandatory ones and other issues so they decided that instead of going for like a sub they would just withdraw as a team and therefore we had a spot left over that's the reason why we played all of the groups out completely. We took the four third places, had them play out an additional last chance group, and Denmark was able to take it. So Denmark, now part of the top eight and able to make a move here. And I'm here for it. Very excited, very interested to see how far the Danish team can go. Obviously, having Crosby in the games is kind of fun and a bit of a throwback to HGC as well. But yeah, we're down to the final eight. Four teams are going to make it to the offline event in Berlin. We have an additional team coming in from North America and also one from Asia. So once again, offline international heroes of the storm and it's going to be awesome. The whole event takes place on the 10th and the 11th of June. And if you want to stop by, you're more than welcome to do so. If you watch this on YouTube, there's links in the description that you can check out. We are hosting the entire event at the Xperia, which is an absolutely amazing venue right in the middle of berlin so perfect if you want to combo heroes of the storm offline together with let's say a city trip to berlin and experience the city so definitely check it out and have a look there there's no tickets by the way there's no entrance fee so everybody is welcome to join and come to uh, shake hands with players casters just other heroes of the storm fans and keep in mind also we have a crowdfunding it's also linked there all of this super expensive again we've hosted two events in miami last year we're trying to keep the heroes of the storm scene alive and we're trying to host offline events with international teams coming in and if you guys want to help with those efforts and support it then uh, check the crowdfunding out uh, would be super important that we have a bit of community support for this as well if you guys are interested for us to do more things in the future and also up the production level on this one well, we got Cross B on Junkrat, and we got Johanna immediately. Blaze on the other side for the Spanish team. And best of five. Haven't mentioned it yet. So uh, now that we are in the final eight, we have best of fives. No best of threes anymore. But this could be a pretty cool game. I mean, Nano obviously. Chromie banned, by the way. One of the reasons why Chromie is banned is that you have Nano on the red team side. I was just about to mention his Hanzo, but they were a little bit faster than I was. So already the pick on Hanzo. Basically, it was always two players in the European scene that stood out for most people when we're talking about Hanzo plays. One is Bishops for the Russian team, and uh, the other one is Nano for the Spaniards here with this Hanzo. So Arrow Boy makes it into game number one. Personally, I find it kind of amusing that Nazebo was banned out as well. Obviously, the Danes have done some research here. And we've seen a few teams go for Nazebo and Tomb of the Spider Queen. There's a little bit more Ragnaros play lately than I expected too. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's honestly, having a Nations Cup is kind of awesome. The band that is going on in the lobbies between the teams and the countries and the discussions that have also happened on Discord, it's kind of fun. It's one of those things that always happens with Nations Cup, with Nations Cups, and uh, you can always uh, take the piss out of the teams a little bit. So uh, it's it's super amusing. I really like it. Nations Cup, uh, Nations Cups are one of these things that are just incredible fun to watch. And there are always a lot of banters also popping in too. But again, we have on the left side this time, we got Anna and we got Urel. So Chinatown dropping that nano boost. And well, on the right side, what are we getting for Drak here and for Jojo? We still need a main tank. Actually, I said Jojo, I meant Johan, but yeah, his nickname is always so confusing. We had Johan and Johanna quite a bit. So, Genji and Muradin! We got Blaze, we got Muradin. Quite a few stuns. 
And Hanzo plus Genji, meaning we got the Shimada brothers now united once again. So, final pick. Two on the Spider Queen. Map number one, starting map in the best of five series between Denmark and Spain. And we still need a bit more damage for the blue team. Imperius can bring the numbers in, has some wave clear, gets an additional stun for them. That leaves Junkrat as the only real range damage dealer. And well, let's go. Two on the Spider Queen. Map number one. Denmark against Spain, game number one. Chinatown is playing Anna for the blue team. We have Crosby on Junkrat, Wayfarer on Urel, Lil Booty on Johanna, and Freaks on Imperius. To the right side of the map, Spain with Drak here on Genji, Exilom on Rega, Nano on Hanzo. That's not a shock. Johan with Muradin, and we got a Pepinazo on Blaze. Let's go! Let's see what we can do in game number one. Also, who takes the lead here? This is an interesting series. It was a really interesting series. Spain qualified as the second in their group. Denmark came in as the last, the winner of the last chance qualifier. And I honestly don't know which team I would currently favor here. We have on uh, level 1, Anna going into uh, the dark build. Yeah, already a bit of a play made for Mirrodin up at the front. And he finds himself in a bit of trouble, has to jump out quickly. Another stun in the middle. This could be a spicy series, for sure. Obviously, in the first group stage, we had a lot of two zeros. Because essentially... Oh, ha, 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 Imperius! Damn! He got murdered. That's the first blood right there. But yeah, group stage, the first one. Definitely a lot of one-sided ones. That was to be expected. With 16 teams signed up, there were a lot of teams that had a very deep player pool to choose from. With some former pros and really experienced players going up against teams that had only a couple of amateurs playing. And with nowhere near the experience that others had. So yeah. Oh, well, I actually was very surprised and very pleased that we got 16 teams to sign up. So that was pretty awesome to see that the Heroes of the Storm community uh, got completely behind this with so many players making a move for that. The kill against Anna. Now they're trying to make another one happen as they're targeting Urel. And it's a goal. Urel is down. That's three kills to zero. Spain is popping off. Damn. I get really mad over here. So yeah, Spanish team comes in, takes three kills right off the bat, establishes a bit of a leading experience. <laughs> Both of them looking at the siege shine and they're like, yeah, okay, then I guess I'm gonna go back again. So yeah, Spanish team is pretty fast to the draw. Kind of surprising, honestly, if you ask me. After living here for four years, the one thing I can tell you is that usually it takes a little bit for the Spanish to get going. I mean, I've been living in quite a lot of countries and one of the things, obviously, that everybody is complaining about is dealing with heavy men, right? So if you, if a worker says like, hey, we're going to come to your place 10 o'clock in the morning to fix something, then it is expected that they're going to be a little bit late. And everybody complains about it. Every single country complains about like, ah, oh, it's crazy over here. These guys, they give me a five hour window where they want to arrive and then they never show up. But Spain puts it on a completely different level. So let me tell you this. People in Spain, like any man in Spain, they don't give a fuck. They don't care. Ah, mañana, mañana. If I don't come today, I come tomorrow. Not the day after, or well, not at all. Like, Spain is just on a different level. So seeing the Spanish right from the get-go, really just doing work here is a little bit surprising to me. Normally, they all need an extra invitation to get anything done, but these boys, they have been getting their caffeine in or whatever it was. Yeah, looking good here. Three kills to zero. Nice escape by Genji at the bottom of the map, as you can see. But we are off to the races as it is Denmark who is trying to stabilize a bit here. Maybe this, maybe Denmark is a little bit asleep again. It's still cold in Denmark as far as I know, so maybe, you know, they just need to shake up some of that lethargy there. Either way, level 7 popping up soon in regards to builds. We got the Reverberation over here on Muradin, so he's gonna go for the Bronze Beard Rage on level 13. Another kill against Junkrat, so Crosby this time the victim of the attack, and that's the fourth kill now for Spain. The Spanish Inquisition, no mercy! Spanish Amarda trying to sail to victory here, apparently. 
Another Stormbolt straight in the face of Jojo. So there's that. And they start to turn in, but at least Jana is able to go and drop that interrupt on them. With level 7, we now also have the Skullcracker, we have the Never Outmatched, and the Totem, as the build continues. 19 to 18 gems delivered, another play being made, this time for Rega. They're trying to get their kill, and they just can't pull it off. Instead, they're losing Imperius again, and Jojo is also low. She makes it out, but that's kill number 5 against the Danish team. <laughs> and they just can't get a kill. They're still waiting for number 1. We now got the Holy Feather over here. We also have the Holy Avenger. A lot of holiness happening on level 7 for them. But the turn it down at the bottom of the map could now give the red team their first Web Weaver wave. And that's exactly what happens. So, Web Weavers are going to touch ground. And the Spanish team is doing surprisingly well here. I love it. Like, very well coordinated. Good attacks. Good ganks. Nice rotations. Escaping with Genji a bit earlier as Draco was going deep initially. Trying to get another kill for them. And they try to make the same play again. Look at Crosby. Stormbolt misses. They might still get the kill here. Yeah, Meridian was attempting to anticipate the Jukes a bit and couldn't. Uh, now they might... Uh, yeah. This time they lose Genji. Finally, Denmark able to get a kill. And it couldn't have happened at a better time for them. Now it's a 4 versus 5 in uh, favor of the blue team. So the defense has just become a little bit easier. But they're still going to lose structures. They already lost some of the walls. Now they're losing a bit more here in the middle. As another tower drops and up at the top, obviously, with Nano just poking this out. And Muradin uh, slowing the rotation down from the middle a bit. They're going to drop another set of towers and gate. The good news is that no fort was lost to the blue team. So that helps them a bit here. We now have nearly level 10. Spain getting a bit closer to rogue abilities. Could be using that advantage, but not quite turning. They just don't have enough gems yet. They're sitting at 23, which isn't too shabby, but they are nowhere near getting a second turn in for free. So for Denmark, they can sit a little bit farther back, play this a bit more passive, focus on their camps first. But of course, it still allows the Spanish team to at least safeguard the gems that they already have. At least they're trying to do that. But the interrupt is happening. Camp is taken, which means that now any moment we're going to get level 10 abilities for Denmark as well. Again, the meme strike with all of the stuns that they have. Not that much of a shock. Blessed shield on the side of the blue team. And there's the rip tire. And of course, let's not forget about the nano boost, which is also going to help Crosby to get more damage in. They're trying to take position around the turn-ins once more. But it's also the blue team that is looking to get their first Web Weaver wave. The interrupts of Hanzo are so annoying though. Each team has a few tools that they can use here to just keep interrupting. For Jojo, it's obviously her flashlight coming in with that trying to hit him hard. And then on the other side, you got Hanzo with the arrows that he can always just simply drop in and hope that he hits them. But either way, we now have still that's um, it's actually a lot if you think about the kills this is a lot closer than you would have initially have thought if i just tell you the numbers here in regards to kills and that one team already had a web weaver wave you would think that the spanish team is a lot farther ahead than they are so denmark was able to keep up quite nicely they didn't really lose too many gems they are sitting at 91 that's a double turn in if they're able to turn in at all that could of course get ruined by spain if they are able to get a few more kills in, especially against Urella, who's holding 38 gems by herself. So, she's able to get that turn in. Mm -hmm. And, well, at the top, another chance to turn in for Spain. They have already turned in another 30 gems. They're getting closer and closer to a second turn in, and at some point, Denmark has to make a move against that. They can't just sit there the entire time and let it happen. 100 gems in their hands, a secret mount unlocked, uh, at least for the team. We now have 39 gems for Urel, who still wasn't able to turn in because Blaze has been interrupting her the entire time. So as the blue team is desperately trying to somehow get to a turn-in point and interrupt the Spanish players, they themselves just don't get a chance to get that turn-in completed. Another three coming through, even with Junkrat dropping a couple of bombs on them. 
They can't get the stun on Imperius, and he's able to make his way back out. But only another nine gems are needed for Spain. And they are closer to the turn in than Denmark is. Well, there's another attack against Jojo. The control that the Spanish team has over the middle of the map is really crazy. Really looking good here. Down at the bottom of the map now, we have Urel still gathering a few more. She's sitting at 43. And we have a level 13 talent advantage now for Spain. And that's the moment when Denmark says, hell, maybe we should fight after all. So they go for Mirrodin. Can they get the kill? Well, not just yet. Crosby goes down. Perfect meme strike by Nano. Crushing it here. Nicely done. They want the follow-up and they are hoping for kill number two. And Jojo falls. 35 gems are on the ground. They're zoning them as best they can. Imperius comes in. He gets most of them, but now he becomes the target. Freaks is nearly dead. They want him. And Drakir, he cannot get him. Can't take him down. They used level 13 perfectly. The talent advantage really coming into play for Spain in that last fight. Now they take the fort down in the middle and they can complete their own turn in. To be fair to Denmark, they still saved a lot of the gems that were lost, so they hold another 97. So they can always try and come back here. It's one of the most important things when you're playing on Tomb of the Spider Queen and you fall behind. You want to make sure that you don't lose too many of your gems. As long as you still have them, you can try and win the game by consecutive turn-ins. But now they lose Yorel. And boy, oh boy, that's a problem. Jojo trying desperately to get back the gems they just lost. She dies too. And this is a total disaster. They lost Yorel, they lost Johanna, they lost the gems. And now, no! Imperius gets absolutely wrecked. What is wrong here? Spain is just ripping them a new one. It's crazy. The Spanish team is just... I mean, they're completely on a different level at this point. They're not showing them any mercy whatsoever. Every time you think there's a sliver of hope for Denmark, all of a sudden Spain just leeches on and takes them down and follows them no matter how deep they gotta go. Spain, the Spanish Armada is crazy. They're absolutely crushing it here. All the forts are gone and they're not stopping there. Look how close they are to level 16 at this point. They're gonna get a talent advantage over the blue team as they're pushing for the first keep of the game. Now we're getting the final cut. Top side, more aggression. And again, just losing the gems is such a huge setback for Denmark. Bless shield, not enough. They lose Imperius again. I mean, holy hell. Spain. Damn, son. Ruthless. Absolutely ruthless. Brutal. Savage. Wrecked. Take them all down. 47,000 damage for Hanzo. As a reason why Hanzo gets target banned against Nano so often. And it's exactly what you're witnessing right here in front of you. 11 kills to 1. Just look how many gems Denmark has. They had 40 gems. They lost more than 80 gems in those last encounters. Now, they might be able to get a turn in. It might not happen, though. Because Johan is interrupting down at the bottom of the map. The boss was already taken. Again, they are making sure that nobody turns in for the first web wave on the side of the Danes. And the blue team, they just don't have it here. Another camp is getting attacked, so this one is still in play. Boss is pushing through the top side. They're gonna try and steal that. Didn't even need the meme strike here, but he yoloed it out anyways. And up at the top, they gotta defend. 13 minutes in. Ah, damage already done. 11 kills, 2-1, two, 2 levels ahead. The push into the middle now with the mercenary camp they just stole from the blue team. And it is the end of the blue team's mid-core uh, keep. <laughs> I want to see a little bit blown away at how well Spain is doing. I expected this to be a very close one, but Spain apparently has other plans, at least when we're talking about game number one. That top keep is also not looking too hot. The core is losing shields. They're still on level 16 for Denmark. In comes Imperius, at least with the stun. Ancestral gets used very early here by Rega, trying to make sure that they're not losing anybody. Ult popped by Urel. And they still get a kill. They jump in and they drop Imperius. 
nibbling at the core shield, not even wasting their time, eliminating the keep up at the top. Insane performance here by Spain. Absolutely love it. The core is losing hit points. They're going for kill after kill. Another Stormbolt, another stun. Wayfarer's in trouble, trying to get out of here. All he can do is run. Well, the rest of the red team is now going for the core again, trying to take it down and lock in the victory on map number one on this best of five. Incredible performance by Spain. Insanely impressive, nice coordination, a lot of aggression from them, and they deservedly lock in the 1-0 lead in this best of five series. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Battlefield of Eternity, map number two, and the Spanish team is in the lead, taking the 1-0. Now we're heading into the second map. Now, once again, quick reminder that we have one rule in this tournament where heroes can't be picked again, so the 10 heroes that have been played in the last game cannot be played again. A little bit of an adjustment. It's not quite as crazy as Meta Madness, but makes things interesting and also makes it interesting for the players here. Now, Spain has delivered. They definitely did. And I think Denmark was also a little bit surprised at how well they coordinated and just crushed the blue team. Hanzo is now out, though, and Chromie gets banned, so they're definitely targeting Nano with quite a lot of their picks here. And as some of the go-to heroes for Spain are unavailable, question is if the red team can keep it up in the same way. Now, this is gonna get real interesting real quickly, because, as I mentioned before, this is a full round robin, right? So we're down to eight teams, it's a full round robin that we're playing out, and then the top four teams are gonna make it to the offline event in Berlin. And there are a couple of favorites. Now, obviously, a lot of upsets can happen, but some of the clean-cut favorites include the people, the teams that were able to take the top spots in the group, and that is uh, France, Germany, and, Sp and uh, Sweden. But upsets can happen. And even if those three really are able to get into the top four, there's still one slot left that everybody is going to be fighting for. If you start in the first play day, though, with a loss immediately, then uh, it's already getting a bit tricky. It's one thing if you lose against a team that you expect to end up in the top three anyway, so one of the favorites, but if you're losing against a direct competitor, then that's a very, very different story. So Denmark against Spain, even if you lose the series, you want to at least net yourself a couple of map wins so that you have a chance, you know, to claw your way back then later on in the round robin or one of the later rounds. So this is already a super important series for both of these teams. Spain with Malfurion and with Dehaka. We got Vala for Denmark. And I'm very curious how... Ooh, Oriel! Oriel super early in the draft for the blue team. Okay, color me intrigued. That is not what I expected here. Shogal incoming, Kappa. But, yeah, so with Oriel, they can at least, when they are fighting out in the middle, they're not really mana dependent. Hope dies last, so let's see what they can do with that. Rexa on top of that as well, so you have a stun. But let's see how exactly Spain is going to react to that. Not the support that I expected here. Let me just put it like this. Vala, on the other hand, arrow build against the Immortal can be great. We've seen, of course, all kinds of variations. Vala is still one of the heroes that's probably the most versatile in regards to her builds. There's a lot of maps you really want to go for a multi-shot build. There's tons of maps when arrow build is fantastic and can always go into an order attack style too, depending on the draft that you're running and the draft that your opponent is going for. So we've seen that played out in most of these. But let's have a bit of a look of what exactly Denmark has in mind here. And also what they're now going to ban out against uh, the red team. They're getting rid of Li Ming. So no Chromie, no Li Ming. Definitely a bit of mage hate that they have there. Trying to also deny some of the carry options that we still have in, uh, in the pool. And Spain has to, of course, come up with a solution here. Now there's still plenty of options available. You can go Grey Main. We've seen a Jimmy already played by the Germans in uh, the first round with the Exterminator on level 1 for immortal damage. And Sergeant Hammer! 
Yeah, the Germans busted out the tank as well, and now it's the Spanish team that does it. Crosby with his Nazebo. All right, spider build or full toad? That's the question. Both can be viable. Changes a little bit on how you're approaching the game on Battlefield, but especially with the increased range on level 1, if you go down that path, you can, from a safe distance, start to nibble away at the hit point pool of those Immortals. So, off we go. And we got Leoric. So, apparently, it's gonna be the main tank, Leo, together with some Oriel support. Interesting draft from Denmark. I like it. What is Drake gonna pick now? We have already Sergeant Hammer, so positioning is gonna be interesting here. When it comes to a push battle, depending on what Nazebo is going to do with his builds, could also be pretty wild. Super curious what we're going to see now. It's Lenara! Bambi's in the house! Game number two, Denmark against Spain. Without further ado, Battlefield of Eternity. Game number two, Denmark! Behind one map as we have Chinatown on Oriel, Crosby on Nazebo. Wayfarer on Rexa, Freaks playing a main tank Leori with a little booty on Vala. On the right side of the map, the Spanish team, after they absolutely dominated the first map, they are now playing Drakia on Sergeant Hammer. We got Exilom on Malfurion, Nan on Lunara, Johan is playing Garrosh, and Pepinazo is playing Dehaka. Let's go! Already, we got the puncturing arrow, so arrow build from Vala definitely confirmed. And it is a spider build. Okay, so full spider from uh, Denmark's Nazebo player, meaning that with spiders they can nibble at the immortal very, very easily. It's a pretty nice move to make if you're just trying to take that down quickly. So while Nazebo in the late game can also do a whole lot of work against structures, especially if you ever get to wild infection and participate in the team fights, the spider build for the immortal is pretty good too. Leo starting the game off by activating his trade and showing everybody what he can do. And Vala is also under pressure. There's a ton of damage over time on the blue team. And Spain is apparently attempting to continue where they left off. And they have been really surprising to me. The Spanish team was always a team where I thought, okay, these guys should have a very strong one, considering that a lot of these players have been participating in tons and tons of tournaments over the last few years. But it's just crazy how aggressive they were already from the start. So I really want to see how far they can go with this. And they want to go to the offline event, you can really tell. Up at the top, uh, Tehaka, careful. Yeah, he's still fine. Tries to connect the drag. Doesn't quite happen, but Leo already doesn't want to continue with uh, the dying. Down to the bottom of the map, though, with Oriel. They're trying to go for the camel. I'm not quite sure if that's going to work out for them, though, because now we all of a sudden have three, four heroes available for the red team, and they come in on the last moment, and they just sneak this away. Vala, apparently with a bit of a death wish, moves into range of Garrosh. He was so surprised. He was like, wait, what? So, yeah, now they got the camp, and they got Sergeant Hammer. And they can now siege up and start to do some structural damage. Not really going Denmark's way in the early game. It's very early though, we're only two minutes in. But already you can tell that this could get a bit tricky very quickly. Depends on Nazebo to an extent. Oh boy, yeah. And the Leo main tank isn't really working too well just now. I mean, generally speaking, if you're having Leoric at the front line, he can die. You don't really have a big issue with that because he respawns quickly, he respawns on site, he doesn't have travel time. If he can draw abilities from the opponent's team and resources, then he trade that can absolutely be worth it for you. He is getting farmed, though. That's the difference. So, Leoric is turning into Leorki here. And if this continues, he might lose the fight to Malfurion, but at least this time he is able to get out alive. The same is, by the way, true for Garrosh, which is a little bit insane. But now it's Immortal time, and this is where the blue team could start to shine. They have six stacks on Vala, we got the repeating arrow in. We have more and more stacks coming together also for Crosby and uh, his spider build. So if they can, at the objective, push hard, then they can try and win the game that way. And that's already what we're seeing from them right here, at least to an extent. They are going for the defensive position, though, trying to defend their own immortal instead of attacking at the top. The Zebo should be done pretty soon here, but they're really suffering from Nano. 
Nano is just such an asset to his team, and in the last game, he's done such a great job. Now he helps him to get the kill on Rexa. Nearly was taken down as Misha connected the stun, but the follow-up just wasn't enough. Now Vala is there too. At least the quest of Nazebo is completed, but they're making another move for the Auric. Hammer is down, so is Leo though. So a two versus four on the map. Crosby trying his best, but he gets killed as well. Now they're going for Chinatown, and this is gonna be a full five-man wipe, isn't it? Well, maybe not. No, they are able to keep at least Oriel alive. Leo responds. We have, yeah, the kill on Garage as all of a sudden Misha and Rex are making their way in from above and he didn't see that coming. Figuratively and literally. So he's down. Halftime show won by the red team on the other hand. And they're still going for more kills. Six kills to two in total. They're about to get level seven. We have a full range build by the way here for Leoric with the Consume Vitality and the Ghastly Reach. So he's really trying to knock it out of the park here. And, well, it's the Shokin Pol level 7 plus, plus the Nature's Cure. Bit of a more even battle now, though. Nezebo, as I told you before, Nezebo and Vala, they are all of a sudden speeding this up very quickly. Now, don't get me wrong, they are still losing the first objective. But they were insanely behind. So you can already tell that if Vala is able to stack a little bit better, which she should, and survive into the mid and late game, they might just be able to drop some of these late game immortals super, super quickly. They have the potential here. With the spider build plus the arrow build on their damage dealers, that is something that's in the cards. Vala is really struggling on the other hand. Every time she's getting attacked here, having huge problems and Garrosh is helping them to another kill. Nezebo is gone and they are just suffering. Just look at this. Sergeant Hammer, of course, in the back, having an absolute field. There's so much space created for Drak here. Now the arrow build is at least completed for Denmark. And Vala on the next Immortal will have a much bigger impact. But already with the first wave, the top fort falls. Big, big value for Spain. And they are continuing with the aggression here. Such a great game by them, honestly. Such a great series, starting things off with Tomb of the Spider Queen in a dominant victory against an opponent that seemed a bit caught off guard. And now in the second game, they're again pulling ahead, taking the lead fairly easily here. And the Haka has, throughout all of this, pushed out the bot lane even further, which helps them not only to get further ahead in experience and try and snowball this towards level 10, but also apply some additional pressure on the bottom four, which Leo is now going to try and uh, deal with. So yeah, Leoric moving in to uh, try and make sure that the fort doesn't take too much damage. And still to move back here. Vala is at 14 stacks now. Next objective is going to be super interesting. First and foremost, because I think that Denmark is going to be able to get level 10 in time. At least they should. Eh, it's going to be maybe a bit close. But they now have tools that they can use in the next fight on the Immortal. Always assuming that they get heroic abilities so they can push back here. Rexa still up at the top. Lunala with a repositioning going into leap. We also have the Napalm Strike here. And of course, as long as they have heroic abilities as an advantage, they are using it as best they can here. Coming through at the bottom of the map to take another fort down that also eliminates the fountains that could be used by Denmark. Just retreat. Johan getting attacked. Another flip on Leo. Can they get the drain? Lunara hopping over. Gets the kill on Vala. Leo is dead as well. That's two heroes down. The immortal spawning another 15. Now they will be back in time, but boy, oh boy, is Denmark suffering here. Spain is not taking any prisoners in this series. Nine kills, level 11. Leo, he came, he saw, and he died again. Veni Vidi Bici. No chance for him. Yeah, this is getting a little bit rough. Immortal is also back up on the map. But as long as there's no level 10 for Denmark, Spain just continues. <laughs> Spain is just sitting there like, you know what? We still have this advantage, so why don't we just siege up on them? They destroyed the wall at the bottom of the map already. And holy hell, the drag continues too. Crosby gets taken down. They finally have level 10. But boy, oh boy, are they having a tough time here. Rexa doesn't stand a chance either. Drops his ult, but just look at Leori getting melted. 
So, yeah, they're looking fantastic. 44,000 damage for Lunara, meaning that Nano nearly doubles the damage of Nazebo. Nano has nearly twice the damage of Nazebo at this point in time. Which is honestly just bonkers. So, yeah, here we go. They're doing an absolutely stellar job with this. And with 12 kills to 2, it's, I mean, it, it, holy hell. <laughs> I feel a bit sorry for Denmark here. Halftime shot is already won, and we've been talking about how they at least have immortal damage now, but they never get into a position to actually use it. So now they are trying to aggressively push out, hoping for a kill. I mean, it's what they need, right? They need to win a fight here. They need to get a couple of kills. The problem is that Spain just falls back for a second because they're so close to level 13 that they're just waiting for the next talent. And now they have another advantage over an opponent that's already struggling. Once again, Rexa in trouble. He's down. So is Oriel. She's dead too. Five versus three. Level 13 advantage. Ravenous Spirit didn't really do anything for them here. And Lunara, what a play by Nano. Dodges the Reign of Vengeance again with another leap. No problem for him. Nezebo at the top. <laughs> he has time for a spray, but that's all that he has. He's dead too. 16 kills to 2. This is getting nasty. This reminds me a little bit of the Spanish team of old. The Spanish Inquisition back in the day with Lucifron and Vortex. But yeah, they're absolutely crushing them. Three levels ahead. Spain is on a roll here. On an absolute tear. The fight here, they're just brawling. It's just a brawl at this point. What they need is kills. The only chance that the blue team has getting a couple of kills, but it's just not happening. They're getting taken apart. Rexa is more dead than alive. Oriel got killed too. Vala is just running away. And there is just no hope, I think, for Denmark in the second game. If they bring this series back, that would be a bit of a miracle. I mean, we've seen crazy comebacks. We've seen crazy reverse sweeps. But at this point, they're just getting play to the wall. Spain makes this look like a quick match. 19 kills to 2. And they're just unleashing on them. 55,000 damage for Lunara. And at this point, Bala is dead. Core is falling. At least Garrosh was killed. So third kill for the blue team. But now they're losing Rek'Sai again. The core is low and is going to get destroyed any second here. It's just absolutely insane. What a performance by Spain. Viva España. Vamos, ladies. Let's go. Game number three coming up next here at the European Nations Cup qualifier. Spain, everybody. These guys, they are not suffering fools, are they? They are coming in and murdering people. Two to zero. And both of the games were pretty dominant. I gotta admit that I did not expect this series to uh, look like this. So I want to see if there's a way for Denmark to somehow bring this back. But honestly, if they want to have a chance to turn the series around or at least take a map win or two so that they can use that in the standings, they need to really, really step up their game. I mean, Spain is just crushing right here. It's kind of nuts. And as I said before, there is obviously a lot of competition here to make it to the offline event in Berlin. I mean, again, players are going to get their flights paid, the accommodation plates, everybody wants to, to participate there. There's tons of teams that never really got the opportunity in HGC or before to go to a lot of offline events. So now that we have another chance for them, they are really doing all they can to lock in a slot in the top four. And every single match you win, every single map you take, gets you a step closer. And Spain has apparently a lot of ambition here, so... I like it. Super aggressive. They're doing well. Now, Infernal Shrines, Hogger gets banned. I would still expect them to ban out Chromie. I would still expect Denmark to at least say, okay, Chromie is a big no-no. They've obviously banned, or they've seen Hanzo played by Nano. 
and Nano had a huge impact no matter what hero he played on the damage numbers, but one of his go-to is Chromie, and I think if they don't ban her out, then uh, she is going to be taken very, very quickly by Spain. So the Spanish team, they ban Carrigan, they get rid of Mephisto, and now it's up to Denmark to decide whether or not they are willing to go up against Chromie. <laughs> They're actually hesitating. All right, so they are hesitating here. They are debating what they should get rid of next. It's not the snap ban on Chromie that they go for here. What's it going to be instead? What are they more afraid of? And well, the ban goes to Tracer. All right, Tracer banned. And let's see how Spain reacts. Are they going to first pick her? Are they going to wait for the 2-3 and risk Denmark claiming her instead? Yeah, they go for Lucio, so they prioritize the support. And now there's a chance for Denmark to get Chromie themselves. I'm actually super curious how the draft is now going to play out there. It was actually kind of fun because back in the day of HTC when Chromie was also a huge factor, one of the things that happened is that Breeze, for example, he started to pick Murden against her with Skullcracker on level 7. And every single time that Chromie would start to ramp up with her attack animation, he would just simply jump on her and start to apply pressure. And it was absolutely crazy how he was able to take out the opponent's Chromie over and over and over again during the fights. She just couldn't do anything. She had no impact. So it was pretty huge. But now we got Sonia for the spin to win on the shrines. And we got Diablo. Chromie or no Chromie? That's the question. Spain, are they going to go for her? Or are they just going to say like, yeah, you know what? On Infernal Shrines, we're going to go down a different path. Greymane and Malthael. So no Chromie just yet. Shying away from her here. Nano, he is the one that locked Malthelm, but they can always swap over. And now it puts Denmark again into a position where they are asking themselves, okay, what should we get rid of? Greymane, though, against Diablo, he can come in with a bullet. Drop him low. Greymane himself on structures again. But there's the ban on Tyrael. All right. So, Tyrael banned out, Tracer banned out, got rid of Hogger, we have Carrigan also eliminated, Maiev obviously could still fill a bit of a similar role if you wanted to go for her instead, brings the damage, brings the tethers, a lot of utility if you want to facilitate some kills, and on Infernal Shrines in particular, she also brings the AoE that you oftentimes want on the Shrines to work on the objective while still zoning out the opponent or attacking them. But Sylvanas is still up, so you don't want to risk that your opponent grabs the Punisher, and then all of a sudden snowballs around an objective against you, so they're banning her out instead. With the double pick, we still need a support too. There's a couple of options of what they could do here, just to name a few. They got Kane Malfuri, and if you want to look more into zoning, you can zone the opponent away from the shrine, or you can just make sure that they can't follow you. Close off those contact points a little bit. And they go for Brightwing instead. So we still have Brightwing for the global. And the final two picks for Spain. Spanish team. Yeah, they need one more damage dealer, by the way. What has Lil Booty played? He played Vala in game number two, and in game number one... Whoa, I can't even remember what he played there. It's been a long time ago. But we get Mediv and Melganis! Okay! Mediv for Drak here, look at that. I can go into the ley line here. And our final pick... Sonia, Cassia, Diablo could go for triple frontline if you really wanted to. But what's gonna be? It's a birdie. False dead, so they have a gust. Can control the portal a little bit more, can gust the opponent away. In an ideal world, I mean, the dream scenario here is obviously a gust into a corner and Diablo's apocalypse. If you get that off, then yeah, you can destroy an entire team, especially if Sonia goes into leap. It's all a little bit more on the risky side, but it's an option for them. We've seen it played out in the past. Either way, Infernal Shrines, everybody. Game number three. Let's go. Denmark against Spain. Game number three. First match point for the Spanish team. And over on the left in blue, we got Denmark. Trying to bring this game back. 
trying to somehow recover here which is obviously not going to be easy for them but they're going to give it their all we currently see them with chinatown on bright wing we got crosby on cassia wayfarer on sonia lil booty on falstad and freaks on diablo to the right side of the map Drag here playing Greymane for the Spanish team. Exilom on Lucio, Johan on Marganes, Nano on Medif, and Pepinazo is playing uh, Malfael. They've been hyper aggressive in game number one and game number two with great success, really making it difficult for Denmark to uh, find their footing in these games. Now we have stacks with the Thunderstroke on level one for Cassia. We have the Gathering Storm for Falstead. So they're trying to go stack into the late game here. We're seeing on the baseline for Medivh Nano attempting to complete that quest, of course. And we're going to keep our eye on him. Portal's already allowing them to go for the bird. And that's the kill in first blood. Well done. Very, very nice push. They get the first blood against the birdie. It is time for chicken. Yeah, more chicken wings in the bucket. Another little player being made as they're trying to go for Crosby again. But off to a good start, obviously. So, yeah. Spain off to a good start. Already chasing Brightwing. Trying to take her down too. And, well, that's kill number two. <laughs> it's crazy. These guys are absolutely unleashed. From start to finish. From the beginning of game number one. Now to game number three. They've been aggressive, aggressive, and aggressive. And now they're empowered by Medivh and all the portal plays that we're seeing from him. Just crazy. Absolutely nuts. It's a great job here. They want to go to Berlin. They want to go to the offline event. And guys, once again, reminder, you can go there too if you happen to live in Berlin or if you want to maybe go for a short weekend vacation in Berlin and combo that off with some Heroes of the Storm. You should definitely check out the links in the description. Also, one more thing that we have. We actually have some Nations Cup merch as well. People were asking for uh, new collections and we put one up on the shop. Has been there for this event in particular and is obviously uh, going to be there for only a limited amount of time only until the Nations Cup itself. So if you happen to come to Berlin or if you're thinking about it and you also want to have some uh, Nations Cup merch, you're more than welcome to check out the link in the description and have a look there. The other collections are still there as well, but we have some new ones too, as just pointed out. Eight stacks for Cassia. Blue team, at least at the top. Surviving for now. <laughs> I mean, at this point, it really feels that in the early game, what has to happen for the Spanish team is that they are trying to survive through all of this because the damage is there. Wayfarer, he's now going for the camp. The same is happening with Greyman on the right side of the map, getting a bit of an assist from Lucio. Middle of the map, Shrine activating and the first objective, we're gonna play for Punisher number one. Diablo with the engage, they're getting aggressive around this. I'm not so sure if that was a smart move. I mean, generally speaking, I'm not against it, don't get me wrong. But they went a bit too deep and they just didn't expect them to be ready this quickly. Now Brightwing is dead, Diablo is gonna die. I like the idea behind it, but the execution was lacking. Three heroes dead. Denmark obviously trying to win this by taking some risks and hope that they pan out for them. And they didn't. They went in too deep, they knew Brightwing could help out very quickly and rotate over, but with the help of Medivh and the portals that he set up, it was too big of a risk and it backfired heavily and now they're even further behind. It was a big risk to take, but again, if you're in a position like the Danish team and you're 0-2, you have to take some risk at some point. If you always play it safe, then very likely you're just going to get more of the same. So in this case, they were hoping to get the kill, get the camp, and then take the lead in game three, and it just didn't work for them. So now they're losing the first objective. It's level seven versus level seven talent. This can still be salvaged, but I'd be lying if I'd say it was easy. 19 stacks for Medivh, Mortar, Punisher in the middle, Brightwing, Sonya up at the top, and here in the mid lane, big jump already procced as the Punisher is coming in. And yeah, it's getting a bit dirty. Front wall taken out, or at least about to. I wouldn't be shocked to... Well, I guess they are not going to get the first fort, right? That would be a bit too much. But taking the wall down and dropping the fort down to 50% is already a pretty big accomplishment. Especially since Marfield isn't even here. He's been staying topside. 
pretty much the entire time pushing another minion wave in as you can see here so yeah there's no big fight happening in the middle of the map the defense was solid but the blue team is now still waiting for their first kill so yeah uh, and bright wing yeah it seems like trash wing is gonna die again yep the fruit fly has been eliminated, but maybe kill number one for the blue team after all. Yeah, there it is. The kill. Malthael is dead. Wayfarer might pay the price. And yep, does so. At least they're getting a counter kill. The rest of the team is also attempting to get out. And since level 10 is now available for Spain, they are, of course, diving deep here. They want to use those heroic abilities. Already the ult of Mephisto, Malthael, what's this guy? Malganis! Used against Falstad. They get the Diablo kill. Grey main survives. Everybody else does too. They are trying to chase them down here, but thanks to the portals that are still being dropped, it seems like they're going to be able to get away. Crosby is hoping to get some extra damage in, but it's just not enough, and he's also not fast enough to make a difference here. Especially now that we're also having uh, Martha Ale come in to help them. Drops the last rights, and Trashwing is dead again. Boy, oh boy. I mean, at least they got a kill, right? So it's not going to be a perfect game, but we have 10 kills to one. Two levels of a lead for Spain. And, yeah. Charged up and static shield comboed with the Garrett of the Ring Storm here. Down to the bottom of the map. Falstad, the birdie, still making his plays or trying to control the side lane. But already has to start out very quickly since the rotation was on its way. We have 33 stacks, by the way, for uh, Medith. So he's getting closer and closer to complete his. Level 10 available. Yeah, there's the gust. The stun into the wall. But immediately Medith is ready with a shield. Safeguarding Malganis. Another quick play being made. Lucio on the back in trouble. Falstead. The build is a bit out there, but he's trying to get the damage in with a flank. Now Sonia has been dropped, so yeah, 11 kills to 1. I actually find it kind of nasty how... How many times have we now seen on the red team one of their heroes being super low just to escape at the last moment and now look at the turnaround. Malganis was more or less dead, uses his ult, comes in with the dark conversion and then they just drop the last rights on the target, get a second stack for Malthael and Medivh completes his quest as well. This is just crazy. They are all over this. They're just chasing them down. They're never really giving them a second to breathe. Never really an opportunity for the blue team to stabilize. Malthel is already on the shrine at the top. That's the second objective they're fighting for. And the blue team isn't even going to make a play for it. Instead, they're going for camps and just try and somehow find their footing again. Top side, as you can see, Malta is reigning supreme on the shrine. Not a problem for him here whatsoever. So they're going to get closer and closer to the next objective here. Whereas in the middle of the map, another fight breaks out. The barbecue, but the portals, the shields. The support from Medif in particular is empowering one play after another for the Spanish team here. Spain is crushing it in this series. Now we got 32 stacks for Cassia. It's not insane, but it's also not too bad. I normally you want to be around 40 at the 8 minute mark, trailing behind a little bit, but it's still within reach. Leyline is out. Are they going to set this up? No, nah, they're not going to go for the kill here. 20,000 damage for Cassia, 27,000 for Greymane. Malthael, by the way, has only put the team to 39. I think he's still going to get it at the top now that they have level 13 as an advantage over the blue team. But the attacks, they keep coming. So while Malthael is pushing the top, they're coming in again with the same play, going for Diablo. Saved by Brightwing. Malthael wasn't here for the last rights this time, but Sonia, she's dropped. Sonia's dropped, and they go for another last rights move. Bam! Stack number three for Malthael. That's a 15 second cooldown reduction that he now has. And of course, they're not stopping there. Why would they? They go for Brightwing and take her down again. Freaks is also in trouble. Boom. Kill number 16 in the hands of Spain. Yeah. Denmark is losing on every lane and every aspect of this game. 16 to 1 on the kill count. Two levels ahead. More than that even. They're breaking through the top. The fort was lost within seconds. The only good thing for Denmark is that the death timers are so low. 
So they're going to be back in just a moment. The good news for Spain is that the death timers of the blue team are so low because that means they can get more kills. And much quicker. They don't have to wait for them to respawn. So yeah, Falstead is dead once more. That's skill number 17. Quick reminder, we're 10 minutes into the game. Brightwing is dead again. Everything that has wings gets destroyed. I think Spain is just hungry. They want wings and they don't care if it's a bird or a fruit fly. They just take them one at a time. Another one goes down. This time it's Cassia. The key, by the way, is not going to survive either, just in case that you're wondering. Sonia, she is also not going to survive this. And with Diablo dying, it's a full five-man team wipe. Only question for Spain is whether or not they can end the game now. And I'm actually not sure because the Punisher has nearly been defeated. They're kind of low in hit points. And now it's the keep that does what Denmark couldn't. Takes down Malganis. So he is gone. 42,000 damage on Greymain. And they got to retreat for now. But spoiler alert. They'll be back. <laughs> they, they definitely will be. Brightwing died six times. Blind as a bat. We got the Executioner. Level 16 talents. Ready for Spain. They dropped the entire top lane. The funny thing to me is that in the middle and the bottom of the map, we still have forts. They still have forts. So, yeah. Gloves of Alacrity. 44 stacks for Cassia. Sonia now has to sit on the side lane and defend the top. They got Falstead, so they can switch Falstead over towards the side lane at any point. If there is a problem later, he can play the global card for them. But the first priority has to be attempting to bridge the experience gap so they at least play on seven talent, uh, on, on the same talents. And yeah, that's not gonna be easy either. That's a huge gap. I mean, we're talking three levels at this point. So you have to soak two levels until you have this level 16 talents, but they're three levels behind in total. This is crazy. This is really crazy. 42,000 damage for Greymane. 30,000 for Maltail. And Maltail, obviously, with the last right stacks that he just keeps racking up, is getting closer and closer to an insanely low cooldown on his ult. It's already a 15 second reduction, but can you imagine this going to minute 20, for example? If he's fully stacked, he's just going to drop these things during the team fight like it's candy. So they go for another fort. Fully out rotated here. Blue team trying to defend a little bit, but they're getting zoned away very, very easily. And then another attack is coming. This is one of those games where Spain has to really make sure that they're not overextending too much. You want to apply pressure, but you don't want to YOLO too hard. Or your opponent has a chance to bring this back with the underdog bonus they're getting if they're getting kills now. But the ley line is ready. They try to go for another kill here. The bullet already out, waiting for the last rights to get dropped, but so far not a chance there. Yeah, nice barbecue move. Sonia wreaking some havoc in the back. They're trying for the kills. Might be able to make it happen. Whereas Malthel is old when you need it. Not using anything here just yet. Is he close enough to go for Sonia? Apparently not. Ah, he was at the top. My bad. I was the entire time thinking that he's actually with the team, but he was split off from them already. So this was essentially a four versus five. I was just waiting for last rights to get dropped the entire team. And I was like, something's off here. So yeah, he's topside. They make another play, another last rights, and bam, stack number five. 25 second cooldown reduction. It's insane. Last rides already on a 40 second cooldown here. They go for Crosby. He activates the shrine. He's like, boys, I'm getting value. And well, the problem is he doesn't. So 23 kills to two. Denmark at this point, you can already see that it seems like they accepted their fate. They at least have a level 16 talents for the fight on the objective. But unless somebody starts to pop off and drops a name or two, then no. So this is the end of Sonia. They're coming in with another possible kill on Diablo. Malthale on the objective. He's going full Germany here. Full efficiency. He's like, boys, boys, boys. You don't win games by killing heroes. You win games by taking the objective and taking the core down. But the rest of Spain is definitely having some fun here. Yep. They are crushing that wall. Preparing for the push. And of course getting them closer to level 20. Let's not forget about the Storm Talents here. Now that they are about to get level 20, they have another advantage. Another last right hit. Six stacks for Malthael. Jesus. 
Please! Stop! Stop! They are already dead! Guys, if you have children watching this and they are... They are just mentally scarred for the rest of their life, it's not my fault. So, please get them out of the room. They're gonna need professional help for the rest of their life because this is tough to watch. 26 kills, 2-2. Two, two. Spain, as I said, turning this into a quick match. The red team is going through Denmark like hot butter through cheese as they are wiping the floor once more with the entire team. Denmark is gone and so are their hopes of turning this around. The core gets destroyed and this is a 3-0 clean victory for Spain in the first play day, the first round of the round robin here at the qualifier for Europe. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.